Welcome to the worship service of the Cashmere Gardens Church of Christ, 4315 Lippenwell Street, Houston, Texas, ministered by Brother Winfred Frazier. It is our pleasure to have you with us on today. Together we will sing praises to God, lift up prayers, read from the Word of God, hear a gospel sermon, have an opportunity to give back to God, and observe the Lord's Supper. Let's now enter into worship. church say amen. amen say amen say amen again amen. we just recited together our core value for the month of march entitled the new self forgiveness god is good church he is not good some of the time but all of the time and all of the time god is good and all of the time god wants us to be good we thank god for life health and strength we realize that we're not here because we are so good, but we're only here because God is so good to us. And everybody, everybody, whether you are listening in, wherever you are, uh, we know that God has been better to us than we have been to him. And he is better to us than we ever will be to ourselves. God is always better to us than we are to ourselves. So wherever you are, wherever you are, whether you are uh, in a spot in your life where things are going just the way you want them to go, or whether you are down, whether things are not going so well, 
Whatever the case is, you ought to pause and thank God for things being as well as they are. We are truly blessed. God woke us up this morning, started us on our way. He has given us a reasonable portion of health and strength. And we are able to recognize the fact that we don't have the power to raise or set the sun. We have no regulation over the air that we breathe. It's all by God's grace, his mercy, his love. If we have what we have, we do what we do, and we are who we are. We thank Brother Reed for opening us up uh, with uh, prayer this morning, and Brother Ron for leading us in psalms of praise to God, Brother Jordan leading us in the reading of the word and in prayer, and uh, we thank God for everyone being on line this morning and for you lifting up your voices in praise to God because he's truly worthy, worthy of all of our honor and all of our praise. We're going to study from the gospel of Matthew on today. Matthew chapter 18 and the verses are 21 through 22. And I will read these verses once again. The Bible says, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. The subject under which we will study on today is entitled, Lord, show us the way. Lord, show us the way. Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 22. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our master. Jesus is our intercessor. He is the one who came from glory to this earth, lived among men, died, on Calvary's hill, on the cross, for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. Doesn't matter where a person lives in the world, Jesus died for their sins. Doesn't matter what a person has accumulated. I was looking at a video the other day about uh, the uh, pyramids in Egypt and how uh, archeologists have uh, gone into the pyramids and found massive amounts of gold and massive amounts of art uh, that's just beyond our imagination for people who we call primitive. And we look at uh, how rich individuals are, but guess what? It doesn't matter how rich, how much you've accumulated, how much talent, how much knowledge you have obtained, doesn't matter about any of that. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans chapter three and verse 23. And Jesus died for our sins. Make no mistake about it. We cannot erase our sins. We cannot remove our past. We cannot undo anything we did yesterday. And because of that, we need a savior. We need someone who can make things right before God for us. And the Bible clearly states that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. First John chapter two and verse number two. And because Jesus died, he was buried and he rose again. Now he wants everyone to hear this good news. Hear the good news that he purchased the church of God, the church of Christ, with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse number 28. And the saved, those who are rescued, delivered from the wrath of God, Romans chapter five and verse eight and nine, are added to the church. Acts two and verse 47, the Bible says, praising God and having faith with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. And that church is identified in the New Testament as the church of Christ. Romans chapter 16 and verse number 16. This Jesus who is our savior shows us the way. And we're going to look at what he teaches us today 
from Matthew chapter 18, verses uh, 21 and following. Now, I've got a question for you. How many of us would or even could forgive a person who has wronged us? Not just once, not just twice, not three times, but as many as seven times. Forgiveness becomes harder and harder for us to do as someone repeatedly does us wrong. The more a person does us wrong, it seems like the harder it becomes to forgive them. We start saying things like, wait a minute, this person keeps sticking it to me, says he's sorry and ask me to forgive him. If he were really sorry, he wouldn't keep doing it. Yeah. Then because that's the way we often think, we start thinking that God says the same thing about us. When we keep confessing sin, the same sin over and over again, have any one did a sin and asked God to forgive them and then did the same sin again and again and again and you ask God to forgive you. So sometimes we think that it becomes harder and harder for God to forgive us and many individuals have actually stopped seeking God's favor. Many individuals have actually stopped worshiping because they feel like God's not going to forgive me if I keep doing the same sin over and over again. So let's see what the text teaches. If we've been in a experience or situation where someone has done something against us and they've asked us to forgive them. What is our attitude? If we are in a situation now where we're doing something against God and we want his forgiveness, even though it's hard for us to stop doing what we're doing, what is God's attitude? Instead of being impressed, you know, with Peter's uh, willingness to forgive, Peter says, you know, or if someone uh, sins against me, uh, do I forgive them up to seven times? That sounds quite generous. And Jesus responds by saying, I do not say. You know, you say seven times, Peter, but I do not say up to seven times. Peter, that might sound good to you, but I don't see it that way. Not up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Then Jesus moves to share a parable that illustrates what our attitude should be because Peter is displaying his attitude. And sometimes, church, we display our attitude. What should I, if I'm patterning, patterning my life after Jesus, what should my attitude be? It should be the same attitude that he has, the willingness to forgive others just as God forgives me. That's what I say. Uh, now, now, I know the, the poor value on your screen says uh, uh, the willingness to forgive others just as I want them to forgive me. But what I want to press upon your mind today is I want to have the willingness to forgive others just as God forgives me. Are y'all with me? So the parable uh, Jesus uh, uh, shares with us is going to uh, help us. Uh, see uh, how God forgives us 
and God, Jesus is going to use and uh, a situation. And this is this was something prevalent uh, back in the time of Jesus. And and parables are uh, situations that Jesus uh, presents to his listeners that they can understand, that they can relate to. This is something that actually happens. And he uses this picture of something that actually happens to teach a lesson regarding how God wants us to live. So in Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 24, uh, there uh, Jesus begins, he says, and when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, master, have patience with me and I will pay you. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Now, verse 24 tells us that the servant owed the king 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. Now, for, for your own personal Bible study, I want you to go and look up what 10,000 talents amount to today. And what I'll tell you this morning is that 10,000 talents mounts up to a lot of money today. A whole lot of money. You can buy a lot of things you can have a lot of advantages if you had 10,000 talents today. But you go look it up for your own personal Bible study. And when you see how much money 10,000 talents is today, you will agree with me when I say that this servant owed his master a lot of money. Now, when we look at what the servant owed the master in comparison to our relationship with God today, we can readily see that our debt to God is tremendous also. It is enormous. Brother Frazier, what debt are you talking about? Well, we have a debt of sin a debt that is so large that just like that servant was unable to pay his master, you and I are unable to pay our debt of sin. Let me show you how, how tremendous that debt was, that debt that, that was to Adam. Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit how many times? One time. Not 10 times. They only ate of the fruit one time. And that one time changed their whole relationship with God. You don't have to commit a hundred sins. You don't have to commit a thousand sins. You only commit one. And that one changes your whole relationship with God. So we have a problem, and our problem is that if we do one, we cannot undo it. The Bible says that Adam and Eve sowed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. In other words, all that they did to cover themselves only exposed them, only exposed the wrong that they did. And that is an indication that you and I have no power to come to undo the wrong that we've done. We have a great debt. Look at Job 22 and verse number five. Look at what God says to Job about sin. He says, is not your wickedness great and your iniquity, listen to this, your iniquity without end. In other words, God says, your list of sin 
goes on and on and on and on. You remember, you remember when, when brethren would uh, lead in prayer, they'd say, God, forgive us of our sin, whether it be by word, thought, or deed. That lets us know that the list goes on and on and on. If somebody is counting what they saw me do, and God is counting what he saw me do, what he saw me think, what he heard me say, where thought or deep, he sees the whole. Our debt is tremendous. You feel good about yourself. You may feel good that it's Sunday morning. It's a beautiful day. But I don't want to dampen your day. I don't want to bring you down. I'm not trying to. But I understand the fact that God sees an ugly picture when he looks at you and I. When especially when he looks at you and I without Jesus Christ. Propitiation means that uh, uh, propitiation means that Jesus turns away the wrath of God. Sweet smelling Savior. There's an ugly oath. And I sin gives out an ugly odor, and then Jesus is our sweet smelling yes. savor. Yes, so, so when we see uh, this uh, servant having a debt <coughs> that he cannot pay, we understand that our sin is huge. It's a huge debt that we are unable to pay. Bible says in verse 25, but as he was not able to pay his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. I tell you, he be sold. The master commanded to sell him and his family. That was devastating. You see, we, we don't, see, we, we, are, we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. We just got through listening and, and observing Black History Month, and we remember the, the, uh, the history of slavery in America. Don't want it. And we are doing everything we possibly can to not experience that ever again. The history is horrible. But think about in this parable, in this setting, the master says, we're going to sell you, sir. You can't pay, so we're going to sell you. And then you might say, well, 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 uh, uh, well, he's going to sell the servant and get his money. Oh, it goes deeper than that. Yes. It goes deeper than just selling him and getting his money. I, I, I would imagine if we could just go into what was involved in selling you would conclude it's better for him to pay than to be sold. Oh, well, just sell me. Just sell me and get it over with. Oh, no. Oh, no. And you'll see that in the text. Oh, no. See, when, 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 when the master says sell him, he's going to, what that means is that this servant is going to lose his freedom. Yes. You know, you, you lose your freedom. Man, listen. You, you've got the freedom to wake up when you want to wake up. You've got the freedom to eat when you want to eat. You've got the freedom to, to see your family when you want to see your family. You know, here, here's a person that don't, don't want to go home. Listen to that. Don't want to go home. You, that's freedom. You don't want to? That means that you can or you can't. But when you are a slave, you don't have the freedom to choose if you want to see your family or not. All, all the freedoms that we enjoy, he loses. You know, you freedom. Somebody rings your phone, you look at the phone, man, I'll catch you later. That's freedom. You got the freedom to answer or not answer. And that's something. Those are the freedoms that we take for Man, you, you, you remember when, when our lights was out and uh, during the storm, freedom. Then you walk in the room, hit the switch. That's freedom. You, know, you, you, can, uh, you, can, you can have, you can, you can be in a room with the light on or with the light off. TV on 
I can't be out. Freedom. Isn't that something? Godly. And he's going to sell him. And he's going to lose all his freedom. Not only is he going to lose his freedom, he's going to lose his family. He's going to lose his family. Here's a man that's married to a wife. And, and listen, his wife is his wife is going to be sold. Now, Brother Ron, Brother George, you both have wives. Now, think about this. Now, you've been with your wife, and your wife is sold. And you, if you say, wife, come here. You can't do that no more. Somebody else that owns your wife is going to say, Linda, come here. Are you with me? Oh, that's devastating. That's devastating. That's devastating. Then your children, all the things that you want to teach your children, all the things that you want to store up for your children, your children are not your children anymore. Your children running around, playing, and, and so forth, having a good time. Yeah, they're not your children anymore. Isn't that something? Then the master says, sell them all. Sell him, his wife, and his children. That's, that's devastating. That's devastating. He's going to lose his freedom. He's going to lose his family. And he's going to lose his future. His children are his legacy. His children are his care when he gets old, but his children are so. So the servant's response to what the master says in verse 26, listen to what he says. Master, have patience with me. He fell down before the master. Master says to sell him, sell his wife, sell his children, and he said, well, you know, uh, they pretty good. I'm pretty good. That sounds like pretty. At least I'll be done with the dead. No, 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 no. He didn't take that. He didn't take that position because he knew. He knew what that meant. Selling someone was immoral. Selling someone was, uh, it was uh, not only immoral, but it was uh, a, putting someone in the position of suffering. And you, you, you're selling your family into slavery. You're going into slavery. You're going to suffer. You're going to be in the hands of someone else. He says, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you. In other words, I'll pay you back. Just give me some time. Even though the test was impossible based upon the size of the debt, he didn't want that. And it didn't matter how sincere he was and how well he meant. You know some, how sometimes individuals, because they don't want something, they say, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. And, and you know, once, they, once, the, once the heat is down, then they'll change. You ever had somebody do you like that? Is you know, uh, um, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do the other. You know, if you just let me go, then okay, I'll let you go. Then if you let them go, then they change yeah. and they do something different from what they said. I thought you was gonna say, yeah, I said that. I said that. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. But it's not as intense now because the heat has gone down. But even though he meant well, now listen to this. Even though he meant well. And even though uh, he uh, might have been sincere, uh, which is questionable as you read the uh, parable, and I'm going to show you, I, I hope God gives me time to show you that today, why uh, that is questionable that he was sincere. The king still had the legal right to do whatever he wanted to collect the debt. No matter what, he's a be patient with me. I will pay, I will pay you. I, I'm sincere. I mean well. The king still had the right yes. to collect the debt any way he wanted to. Yes. Let me say that again. I, I don't think y'all y'all are getting me. You know, you, you, you come to church. You, you come to God. You're having a problem. It's the Lord. If you fix this problem for me, I will do this. How do that? I really mean it, Lord. I mean it this time. I will do it. Listen, no matter how sincere you sound, 
no matter how much you mean well, God still has the right to collect the debt any way he chooses. The final word is his. That's a hard fact. That's a fact that we, God, you're a loving God. God, you're a good God. God, you you don't ever, uh, you, 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 you've done so many great things in the past. Listen, no matter what God has done in the past, in your life, he still has the right. He still has the power to collect the debt any way he chooses. That's why we need a relationship with him. When you look at the fact that God is our creator, God is our master, he's our king, he's our provider, he's our protector, he's our sustainer, he has the authority to hold us accountable for our debt. Now, when you look at our society, we see circumstantial evidence when a problem exists, we see reasonable doubt, we see self-defense, uh, we see pleas of insanity that we can present to our human system in order to remove debt. See, if, if someone uh, kills someone, uh, they kill them in self-defense. So that self-defense can remove the debt. So we've got several things in our human system to remove the debt that we owe. But listen, when it comes down to us making our journey from earth to glory, there is only one solution to our debt, and that is the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18, Paul says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. There is nobody else. When we look at how good the world makes sin look, remember there is only one person that can get you from earth to glory. When you're thinking about how things are in the church and folk are not right in the church, listen, don't compare people with God. God is right no matter how long people become. No matter what happens on this side of life, God is still right. Remember Paul says in Romans chapter 3, he says, what if some don't believe? Does that make the word of God of none effect? He says, God forbid that God be true and every man a lie. So, uh, so understand, no matter how good the world paints pleasure, no matter how good the world talks against the will of God. The world talks against the will of God. Yes, it does. But understand something. When it's all said and done, there's only one person that's going to get you from earth to glory, and that is the Lord. Paul says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and watch this, and bring me safely into his heavenly king. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 27, we see the king's response to the servant's uh, plea. The master of that servant, the Bible says, was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Now, in our system of business, there is what is called debt suspension. This means that the person owed is not actively engaged in collecting the debt. However, the debt still exists. And then there's debt compromise. This means that the person owed agrees to take a lesser amount to satisfy the debt. However, the debt still exists. And then there's debt termination. This means that the person Oh, agrees to give up their right to pursue collection of the debt. Now, remember, the core value this month teaches us that we must accept God's concept of forgiveness. Let me say that again. We're going to go over that in Bible class. We must be willing to accept God's concept 
of forgiveness. Now, what Jesus is going to do is show us that he has a concept of forgiveness. Now, let me read it again. Verse 27. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. That's God's concept of forgiveness. Now, watch this. The king gives the servant more than he even asked. He cancels the debt completely. It's not like a debt suspension. He did not suspend the debt, and the debt still exists. He canceled the debt. The debt does not exist anymore. He does not accept a compromise from the servant who owed but didn't pay. He didn't, he didn't take a lesser amount. He didn't take anything. He just canceled the debt completely. The king does not give up his rights uh, also to collect the debt. Now, he doesn't do that. He doesn't give up his right uh, to collect the debt. Doesn't do it. He doesn't accept a suspension. He doesn't accept a compromise, but he doesn't give up his right to collect the debt. Okay, now, how do you know that? Well, it's because he's going to come back and he's going to imprison that servant because he did not now, I'm going to say it for you because I want you to get it. He did not accept the king's concept of forgiveness. No. Are y'all with me? Okay. Now, now, what he did, he, he got the king's forgiveness. All right. I got mine. Then he ran off. Now, instead of him getting the forgiveness and the concept of forgiveness, he just grabbed the forgiveness and ran with it. So when he got to his servant, are y'all with me? All he wants to do is collect the debt. I'm going to collect me some debt now. He collected some debt. It, it, it's, just, it's amazing how that sometimes we can have something right in front of us and miss it. Miss it. Miss it. So, so, so now here's what I want to. I'm, I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here. And I want you to understand that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is God's cancellation of our debt. That's right. Jesus' Jesus's death on the cross was God's cancellation of our debt, a debt we could never satisfy on our own. I want you to think about it this morning. We've done some things in our lives. We, we've hit them back. I'm not trying to get in your business, but we've hit them back, way back in our minds. So we don't want to talk about it. You know, we, we, don't, we don't want it brought up. You know, somebody close to you, they, they, they want to talk about it. They don't, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. That's over and done with, you know. Leave that way at least. And you know what Jesus did? He went all the way back to that thing that you don't even want to talk about. That thing that you don't want to face no more. He went back and he got it and he canceled it. He canceled it. Because you don't want to deal with it because you, 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 you don't want to face it. You don't have anything to give back on it. You don't have any, you, you can't do anything to undo it. But Jesus at the cross went and got it. And he had compassion on you. And he released you from it. And he forgave you. And sometimes, church, when we, we come to we come to worship service, and, you know, and, and, and I know we, we gotta we gotta take our bath and, and put on some clean clothes and come to worship service like we're supposed to, because we're giving honor to God. We're giving honor to God. Even, even when you're on Zoom, you know, get on up, take, take your bath. Put you some clean clothes on and give God the honor. You know, don't sit in front of God with your bad robe on. Give God honor. And sometimes when it comes down to us worshiping, we, we think about this exterior. But I understand that the Lord, he reached back into our lives. And got the stuff that we dare not deal with right now. Yeah. And he had compassion on us. 
He released us and he forgave us. He canceled that debt. And because of that, we ought, we ought today want to have him in our lives. And if you don't have him in, his, in your life, then you ought to want to. You ought to want to. I'm begging you this morning to please embrace the grace of Jesus Christ. Believe you died for your sins. Believe he was buried. Believe he rose again the third day. Believe the blood is shed at Calvary. Purchase the church of God, the church of Christ. Believe that with all of your heart. Repent of your sins. Make up in your mind that, that God is right about everything. He's right about everything. Make up in your mind that you're going to give him the honor and the praise in your life. That's the only way you're going to turn to repent. When you talk about when you talk about repentance, if you go look up uh, the term repentance, is a turn again. But listen, you're not going to turn unless you believe that God is right. You're not going to turn to him unless you believe that he's right about everything. If you're traveling down the interstate and you think you're going the right in the right direction, you're not going to turn around until you make up in your mind, I'm not going the right direction. That's when you're going to turn around. And the only person that can correct our direction is Jesus Christ. He's right about everything. Acts 2 and verse 38, uh, Mark 16, 15 and 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Acts 20 and verse 28, confess Jesus, Acts 8, 37, confess before men that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we'll baptize you. And in baptism, all your sins are washed away. Everything you've done in the past is washed away. And the Lord will add you to his church, Acts 2 and verse 47, and he'll add you to the church of Christ. Romans 16 and verse 16. You ought to want to be a member of the church of Christ. Wear the name of the one who saved you, the church of Christ. I'm so proud that, it's, that I'm a member of the church of Christ, not because I'm so good, but because I know I can read it in the Bible. Yes, sir. And when I stand before the Lord and he says, well, Fraser, where did you get that from? Like I said, I got it from your word. That's what you say. Yes. That's what you say. But if I'm anything other than what the word says, then I don't have. I don't have a leg to stand on when it comes before God, because he's going to judge me by the word of God. If you're a Christian this morning and you and you have not been forgiven, maybe you got a frown on your face. Maybe you've got some stress on your mind. Maybe you're not speaking to someone. Maybe uh, you are uh, you're isolating yourself from the church, from your family, whatever the case may be, all because you have not forgiven. You have not grabbed God's concept of forgiveness. You ought to rededicate your life to Jesus by repentance, confession, and prayer. Don't let anybody, don't let anything separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. James chapter 5 and verse 17, the effectual firm of prayer of the righteous availeth to us. We confess our sins when we pray. This is your opportunity. You can acknowledge yourself by chat, by text. Uh, you can do so verbally after we sing a verse of a song. Jesus, Jesus, oh, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noon time, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus when the sun goes down, love him, love him, love him, oh, love him in the morning. Love him in the noon time. Love him, love him, love him when the sun goes down. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him in the morning, praise him in the noon time. Praise him, praise him, praise him when the sun. Before, before Brother Jeremy, you uh, acknowledge the request, Sister Mills called me last night and asked if I would sing a verse, uh, Precious Lord. And uh, she's in the hospital. I don't know if she's on, uh, but let's, let's sing just a verse. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am worn through the storm, through the night. 
Do we know what hospital Sister Mills is in at this time? Yes, sir. She's in Methodist Hospital, room 456. She's in the main building, the green elevators, 456. Yes, sir. Okay. The Methodist at the um, in the medical center? Methodist in the medical center. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Sir. Okay. Thank you. We also um, thank you for the lesson that you brought today and really... Um, Touched us as um, teaches us about forgiveness. We thank you for the lesson this morning. We also want to ask prayers, um, Tamika, Sister Tamika Randall, ask prayers for her family, continue prayers for her family for strength. Um, we want to uh, remember that prayer request. Also, we have a prayer request from Sister um, Nancy King. Um, she has prayers on behalf of her brother, Frank Bailey and Abilene. He um, slipped and fell doing, um, on ice, and he sustained uh, severe injuries. Um, so please let us pray for his recovery. And that is, again, Frank Bailey, the brother of Sister Nancy King. Let's continue to pray for him. Also, Sister Jackson requested to please pray for her Aunt Marie. Um, she is having surgery this morning. Let's keep um, Marie, um, Miss Marie, um, in prayer at um, at the appropriate time. Um, do we have any other prayer requests that need to be made verbally? You can unmute yourself at this time if you need to make a prayer request for verbally. Yeah, brother, brother Jeremy, uh, add Sister Mills uh, to the that she's requesting prayer for her family. Of course, of course. Any brother other? Jeremy, this is Brother Troy. Yes. I ask prayers for my health, and everybody pray for me, and, and then God will forgive it too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We definitely have, and we definitely will continue those prayers. Brother, Brother Jeremy, this is Sister Fulton. I I like to ask the church to keep me and my family in your prayers. Oh. oh. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Any other prayer request that needs to be made at this time? If not, um, let's go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer as we lift up these prayer requests of our dear brothers and sisters. Um, dear Father, we thank you today for allowing us to have the opportunity to come and worship you this morning. We thank you for allowing us to um, have the opportunity to worship you. Even though we're not in the uh, physical building, um, we are still able to worship you with the technology that you blessed us with. And we don't take that for granted. And we thank you, Father. And we don't want to have the attitude that we're not worshiping because we're not in a physical building. But we have worshiped you ever since the pandemic has started on every Sunday. We have not missed a Sunday to worship you together. And we thank you for that, Father. Mm. We want to keep um, um, lip sister Mills in prayers, um, Father. We realize, we just learned that she was has been hospitalized. Um, we want to pray for her at this time, pray for her family yeah. as they are caring for her. We pray for the medical professionals who are caring for her at this time. Just keep our dear sister lifted up in prayer and you heal, and we asking that you heal her mm -hmm. when, um, if it's your will, Father. We want to also continue to pray for Brother Troy Neely in prayer, Father, continue to pray for his health and strength, Father, continue to lift him as well in prayer that he will continue to recover from his health, health situation. We also want to keep the brother of Sister Nancy King in prayer. Um, we want to pray for him, Father, as he makes a recovery from the fall that he suffered um, due to um, slip on um, ice, Father, um, Frank Bailey, Pete Brother um, Bailey in prayer. We also want to keep um, Sister Regina in prayer, Father, as she asks for prayers for she and her family. Um, keep that family strong and grounded in your word, Father. We also want to pray for the aunt of Sister Jackson, Miss um, Marie. Continue to keep um, that sister in prayer 
as she is undergoing surgery this morning. She might be in surgery at this time, mm-hmm. Father. We pray, Father, that you guide the hands that are performing the surgery because we know, Father, that they received that training because of you. And we want to keep um, her in prayer. And we pray that she will make a successful recovery from the surgery and that her health will continue to be improved um, following the surgery. Continue to be with that family as they provide support unto her. We want to also keep the um, Tamika and her family in prayer for continued health and strength. We want to continue to keep Sister Randall in prayer, Joyce Randall in prayer, as she uh, for her health and strength as well, Father. Continue to keep the Randall family as a whole strong and grounded in your word, Father. Um, we want to also, Father, ask prayers for the congregation as a whole. We have so many um, folks that are, are on our sick list, Father. We have some. Um, we have many persons who are um, dealing and working on bereavement. Father, we want to continue to keep the Calhoun family in prayer on their home going and assist the Calhoun. We want to also keep. Um, the Brown family, Linda Brown, Sister Linda Brown's family in prayer on the home going of her um, father and brother Austin. Keep, continue to keep those families in particular in prayer and all the families that have on, on, ongoing um, and saying goodbye to their loved ones m- most recently. We pray, Father, that we uh, continue to worship you in spirit and in truth as we go forward in the continuation of our service. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen. Right. We will now have our offering and communion um, at this time. Good morning, church. Good morning. We thank God for this morning, and we thank God for the lesson that was presented before us. This part of the service is for the offering. We find that the first century Christians gave in the first day of the week. What is the Bible that tells us in Acts in 1 Corinthians 16, the verses are one and two. And now concerning the collection for the saints, even as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, that every one of you lay by him in store as he's prospered, that there will be no gathering when I come. Jesus says in Matthew 5 and 20, for this I say, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Second Corinthians 9, the verses are 6 and 7. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly reaps sparing, he which soweth bountifully reaps bountifully. Every man according to as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly nor of necessity, for it is God that loves a chill forgiver. Shall we bow? Dear most gracious Father, we approach your throne. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to share in another worship Sunday, Heavenly Father. Thank you for all those who have tuned in, Heavenly Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we gave according to you, Heavenly Father. And forgive us of our shortcomings if we did not, Heavenly Father, prepare to give, Heavenly Father. For only you can forgive us of that trespass, Heavenly Father, and help us be better on tomorrow than we did on today. Be with us, Heavenly Father. Bless those who've been given the business of the church to use those funds, Heavenly Father, to work, Heavenly Father, here in the kingdom on this time side, Heavenly Father, and that those things will be done according to you, Heavenly Father, and your vision and your plans for the church on this time side of life. This is our prayer in your dear son, Christ Jesus' name. Let us all say amen. Amen. This part of the service is for the Lord's Supper or communing with the Lord. We find in 1 Corinthians 11, the verses are 26. For as often you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do keep or proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. We find that the first century Christians partook of the Lord's up in the first day of the week. You find the writings in Acts 20 and 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. We will follow the Lord's Supper as given to us in Matthew 26, the verses are 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and break it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Shall we bless the bread? Dear most gracious Father, we approach your throne, thanking you for this day. 
Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this momentous occasion by which your son is left for us to have, Heavenly Father, to remember that great sacrifice every Sunday, every first day of the week, Heavenly Father. We pray for your blessings to be on this bread, which is his body. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for his willingness to go to the cross, Heavenly Father, and to bear that cross, Heavenly Father, according to your salvation, Heavenly Father, to this world. We thank you for this opportunity to share in this momentous occasion. This is our prayer in your son Christ Jesus' name. Let us all say amen. You may be partakers of the bread. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Let us bow, dear most gracious Father, we approach your throne, Heavenly Father, thanking you for this fruit in the cup, which is your son's blood. We pray, Heavenly Father, because we know that it's through the blood, Heavenly Father, that the church was born, Heavenly Father, and for in that blood, Heavenly Father, is the cleaning agent, Heavenly Father, for our sins. We pray, Heavenly Father, for what it does on this time side of life for the church, Heavenly Father. We thank you for such a great sacrifice, Heavenly Father. And we pray that we've entered into this remembrance, Heavenly Father, the way that your son has given it, Heavenly Father. And we pray this prayer in his name, Christ Jesus' name. Let us all say amen. You may be partakers of the cup. But I say unto you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That has been the Lord's Supper, a communion with the Lord for today. Thank you, Brother James. Um, we want to again acknowledge um, our visitors who are online with us today. Uh, we don't take um, that for granted. We thank you for attending worship with us today, and we pray that um, you won't be a stranger and always feel free to come and worship us because today's worship service would not have been the same without you. We thank you very much, and we pray that God continue to bless you in your lives. Thank you for being with us today. Please contact us for a Bible answer to a Bible question, a prayer request, a call from the minister, communion supplies, how to give electronically, and our weekly schedule. Until the next time, may God bless you and keep you is our prayer.